so let's talk about our second kind of notation for knots called the Dalker notation. So here's my 6-2. Um, and we're going to take that approach that we did at the very early parts of the semester where what we want to do is just look at the crossings that are there um, and, and just label them kind of in the order that we see them. So we'll fix an orientation on our knot. Maybe I'll start over here and, and move from left to right. So we're going to go this way along the strand. Um, and then we'll just number the crossings uh, as we go. And as we do that, one of the things that we noticed early in the semester is if we make a full circuit around this knot, we're going to end up meeting each of these crossings twice. Once as we go on the understrand of that crossing, and the other time as we go on the overstrand. So each of the crossings that we get in this process, we're going to end up enumerating twice. So if I start here on this upper left-hand strand, then I might just say one for starters, and then follow this crossing out. I'm going to get two over here, uh, and then following around this way. I'll have three there, four there, five over here, six. And now when I get back to this crossing, seven, I've numbered this crossing up here, both two and seven. Right? So that's OK. We're just going gonna, gonna to run with that and keep going. Then I'm going to have one eight on this side. Um, six and nine are going to enumerate the same crossing there. Three and 10, the same crossing on the right. Four and 11. 5 and 12, and then I know that I'm done, uh, right? Because I've numbered each of the six crossings of this knot twice, uh, and I've written down 12 numbers. Um, so what the Dalker notation does um, is it looks at how these crossings are sort of paired with one another, right? One is paired with eight, two is paired with seven, three is paired with 10, and so forth. Um, and it just tries to write those out um, in kind of a horizontal line. So one of the observations we can make is if we want to arrange all of these crossings in a, in a horizontal line, um, then we're going to be writing each of the numbers 1 through 12 um, either on the top of this line or on the bottom of this line, depending on the role that they play in these various crossings. And also, in each of these crossings, one of the numbers that we used to label it was an even number, and the other was an odd. Right? Um, so one of the ways to be systematic about making sure to list every crossing um, once is to list all the even numbers on one side of this line and all the odd numbers on the other side. So in the standard form of Dalker's notation, we'll list the odds up here on the top. So my 1, 3, 5, and 7. Actually, more than just that, right? My 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. I'll list all of those on the top just to get my process started. Uh, and that's going to be the same for every six crossing knot. Right? I'm always going to have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11 on the top. It's what I match them up with on the bottom that's going to determine what type of six crossing knot that we end up with here. So in the knot that we just uh, took a circuit of, 1 is paired with 8, 3 is paired with 10, 5 is paired with 12, 7 with 2, 9 with 6, and 11 with 4. So this Dacker notation is now enumerating the, the, the 6 2 knot. Um, does this have enough information in it yet? Um, so, how will we know, for example, from this notation whether or not we have the 8 going over the 1 and the 2 going over the 7? Right? Um, if I circle the over strands here, this 8 is going over the 1. Um, in the 10-3 crossing, it's actually, well, hold on. So to figure out how to turn this back into our diagram, um, we'll just start with this first crossing, which we labeled with a 1 and an 8. And we'll decide whether to make that crossing an overcrossing or an undercrossing. And it doesn't matter which decision we make. The worst that happens is we get the mirror image uh, of the knot. So let's suppose that we make this an undercrossing, uh, which is what you did, right? Yes. So then that means that there's a strand right here. Um, and then the goal is going to be to connect that strand up to the next crossing in the line. See the, the thing, though, that's a little different? The next uh, crossing that we should get after we look at the 1-8 crossing is we need to connect that to 1 needs to connect with 2, and 8 needs to connect with 7, right? And so what we need is a loop that takes us over to this crossing over here, right? Um, and that that is going to be, since this was an undercrossing, we're going to make that one an overcrossing? Yes. 
So we'll take this and we'll move it over to 27, and that will become uh, oops. That's going to do that. I believe, right? Um, and now one is connected to two, seven is connected to eight. Um, now what about three? Right, so then we would connect two down here over to three on this side uh, in a way that, again, is going to respect the alternatingness of this knot. Uh, so this is then going to need to be... Now I think I can see why arranging them in, in the other order is probably good, because now I've sort of boxed myself in <laughs> in the middle, where in order to get out of here, I'm going to have to create an extra crossing. Um, because the next place I would have to go is I would need to connect three with four, right? which is going to require that I go all the way over to this side. Um, I can't do that without creating another crossing. So I think that, yeah, if we want to go the other direction, that we do want to rearrange the crossings in a way that puts one through six on the same side. And then one connects with eight, two connects with seven, uh, three connects with 10, four connects with 11, five connects with 12, and six connects with nine. And now if we follow that process, if we make one eight and under crossing, we would then connect that to 2, 7. Mm -hmm. um, and you did that by making it. So that's going to sneak under. And that's going to sneak under. Right. I actually um, just did over, under, all the way 1, one through 6. Uh -huh. And then tried to connect the right. snake. Right, so at then the we'd end. be breaking it there, we'd be breaking it there, right? Yes. Um, and then 7. Uh, sorry, so third, So now we did the 2, 7 crossing. Then we would need to connect that with... So, what? yeah, what we're kind of doing here is thinking about the crossings, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all in a row, and then asking, all right, where is the next crossing going to be? And for that, we loop back to the 7, um, and then back to the 8 on this side. Uh, and then we would need to go around to 9, which, which we can't do by following this strand, because we would have to create extra crossings, what we could do by following this strand. Mm. Off to the left. I was able to get to nine. Good. Um, it doesn't make a difference to the type of knot, so let's follow that around to here. Uh, and it was this. Yes. That crossing. Um, and so that gets us to nine. And then to go over to 10, we would go this way. Mm -hmm. 11. 12, and then at that point we're done, so we circle back to the original. So we had sort of, one of the things that we had to have an agreement about here is what was that this was an alternating knot, right? And that alternating knotness shows up in this first assumption that we made when we listed the crossings one through six uh, to say that those crossings are going to alternate. Um, over to under, over to under, over to under. Okay. But once we have that agreement, then it should be the case that any permutation of 7 through 12 down here on the bottom uh, is going to give us a recipe that we can connect up without creating any additional crossings uh, and give us a knot. Uh, and then we hope that when we do that process um, and arrange, you know, apply whatever Reitermeister moves that we need to, and really there wouldn't be many Reitermeisters, they would just be planar isotopes, just, just bending strands around we should be able to shape it into this knot. Um, and so what you can imagine is that this is a way of giving, this is a way of tabulating knot projections, right? We don't know the extent to which this tabulates knots themselves because how many different ways are there to permute these six entries on the bottom line, the numbers seven through 10? How many different permutations of six elements are there? Six factorial. Six factorial, 720. <laughs> there are 720 different ways, six factorial, 
um, to list the numbers 7 through 10, 7 through 12, right, uh, underneath this line. And so what that should mean is that there are 720 different Docker notations for six crossing knots. But are there actually 720 topologically distinct six crossing knots? These are the kinds of questions not theorists love, right? And this is what a lot of the early work around knot theory did, right? It's, it was an attempt to say, within this class of knots, how many different knots are there actually, right? How many different knots with six crossings are there? Um, and it's a hard problem because you can imagine that Reitermeister moves can take a lot of those different looking presentations and show that they're actually the same. Um, so and it, one fun exercise uh, that you could try is this is one example of a Docker notation for 6.2. Um, can you find a different example of a Docker notation for 6.2 um, that would still have six crossings, but which maybe lists 7 through 12 in a different order? Because mm -hmm. um, there must be. If we look in the, the table of knots at the end of uh, the book again, if we look in our field guide, um, there's actually not 720 different six crossing knots uh, listed in the back of the book. There's a total of three. So just for example, you kind of picked the starting point. Uh -huh. If we took that same exact sketch, but pick some different starting point. Pick a different starting point. We would get a probably, I'm guessing, probably. a different set of numbers on the bottom. But it's worth trying. Not. Yeah, it's worth trying. Uh, pick a different starting point and see if you do get something different. I think you do uh, in this knot in particular, right? Because we have kind of a place in this knot where we have these three crossings that are basically kind of the same as one another, but this crossing in the middle and these two crossings up here, we decided are kind of, you know, that they're these three separate worlds almost. The three crossings on the bottom, the one crossing in the middle, and the two crossings on top. And the order in which we interact with those seems like it makes a difference, right? Um, the fact that seven and eight matched up with one and two, these consecutive numbers matched up with these consecutive numbers. Um, seemed like that might have been a clue. Same thing down here. These 3, 4, and 5 matched up with 10, 11, and 12. Somehow maybe that's a reflection of the fact that those are part of the same group of twists. Um, whereas, you know, if 1, 2, and 3 had matched up with 6, 7, and 8, then maybe these two twists would have belonged together with this one. Right? So I wonder if there's something in the consecutiveness of the, the numbering in the Docker notation that might clue us in to some features of the Conway notation and the tangle uh, for this. That's a question that I don't know if anybody has looked into, um, but it might be worth, now that we've had a chance to talk about both of these things today, um, that might be worth some more thought. So let's come up with a Docker notation for 7.2. One of the nice things about this atlas of knots is that they're all presented in their alternating projections. So we know that finding the Docker notation for them is going to be straightforward. We don't have to do any rearranging to get it to be alternating. So there's what I get for Docker for this one. So what we see here are these two blocks of consecutive integers paired with consecutive integers. 3 through 7 get paired with 10 through 14, albeit in reverse order, right? Um, and then 1 and 2 get paired with 8 and 9. And there's something satisfying about that somehow, right? Yeah. Because the fact that consecutive gets paired with consecutive means that those are just two strands that are crossing each other repeatedly, right? Uh, without anything in between happening. Uh, and so that argues for there being sort of five twists over here, plus or minus, I mean, we don't really know at this point, uh, and then two twists over here, plus or minus. Right? And sure enough, here's the Conway notation for seven, two. It's a five and a two. Uh, so it does seem like there's something to this conjecture. It would take a little bit of doing to put this onto a firm mathematical foundation, but the conjecture is that um, consecutive integers paired with consecutive integers, let's say n consecutive integers, paired with n consecutive integers in Docker notation uh, indicates a plus or minus n twist.
in the tangle for our knots. Right? Um, hmm, cool. Uh, it'd be worth looking through some of the other examples in here and seeing if that holds true. Um, for, for instance, we might even take one of these star-shaped knots, like 7-1, um, and look at the Docker notation for that. What would you expect the Docker notation for 7-1 to look like? So if we think about 7-1, whose Conway notation is just a single number 7, it's a continued fraction of length 1, uh, which would mean that the fraction of the rational tangle for this would just be equal to 7, right? Because uh, as a continued fraction, 7 would just equal 7. Um, let's verify the conjecture for this, that we would expect the Docker notation to just be one long string of consecutives. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 should be paired with 8 through 14, either in the same order or in the reverse order. Um, let's just verify that that happens. If I start right here, right, then I'm going to meet 1, 2, uh, should decide which strand I'm using here. So I'm going to use this strand. 2, and then 3 over here, 4 down there, 5, 6, 7. I made one trip around, uh, and now if I continue, I'm going to meet this crossing, which is now 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. How about that? So 7 matches 14, 6 with 13, 5 with 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. And the entire Docker notation for this is one big long block of seven consecutive pairs. Right, a, a, seven, a, 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 a pairing of consecutive integers, which is seven in length. Um, and sure enough, if we were to snip this knot, let's say, here and here and stretch it out, we can make it into one long seven twist um, that would then make this as its numerator closure. Um, so there does seem to be something to this uh, and a relationship between Dowker and Conway um, that we can get a little bit out of. What's nice about Dowker is it seems like it's really constructive, right? This tells us specifically a recipe for how to rebuild this knot uh, from knowledge of its crossings. As long as we agree that we're, what we're constructing is an alternating projection. Uh, we haven't done the work of showing that alternating projections always exist, um, but if we can take that on faith for the moment, um, we can actually think of Docker notation as a way of proving that alternating projections exist. If we can write Docker notation for any knot, then presumably we can just rearrange um, the order in which we present the crossings in a way to make it alternating. Um, and it would seem like if we were trying to tell a computer what a knot is, Docker notation is one way of doing that, because we could classify any seven crossing knot as just this list of seven numbers from 8 through 14, right? Any ordering of 8 through 14 is going to determine a diagram for a seven crossing knot, and therefore it's going to determine some knot whose projection has seven crossings in it. Uh, again, there's five, what, what would be, seven factorial is 5,040 different possible Docker notations for seven crossing knots, but when we look in the atlas, um, there's only seven alternating knots in their simplest form, which are what are called prime knots. I'm going to talk a little bit about what prime knots are. Um, but in the, yeah, in the field guide in the back of, of Adams, there's only seven. There's not 5,040. Uh, so clearly, there's a whole lot of different Docker notations that all represent the same seven crossing knot, and probably a whole lot of Docker notation for seven crossing knots that represent knots that are actually not seven crossings in their simplest form. They might be fewer. Um, so I think that's one of the big limitations of Docker, uh, is that it's far from being a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between the actual topological type of the knot and the seven numbers which we use to write down its Docker notation. But this hopefully helps us get a little bit more clarity on how we can tabulate knots just by looking at the overs and unders of all of their crossings in a projection. So second conjecture. Let's start putting people's names on this. This is the Hughes conjecture. Hughes conjecture says that the order of the consecutive integers tells us about the orientation of the twists. So um, this block of five twists, because it was descending, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, that that argued that this was a minus five. 
and the fact that this 8, 9 here was increasing argues that this is a positive 2. And if we connect that back to the diagram that we had down here for the knot um, 7, 2, um, these five twists down here at the bottom, if we were to stretch these out so that they were ho all sort of oriented horizontally, um, then yeah, that would be a negative slope, this would be a negative slope, this would be a negative slope, this would be a negative slope, and that would be a negative slope. So that, that would give me minus 5. Okay. Um, and then somehow we would have these two on the top. But in order to figure out these, we would have to turn our heads in such a way as makes these horizontal twists. And if I turn my head to look at these horizontally, um, those also now look like they become positive. Positive 2. So the conjecture is that. Um, ascending uh, ascending sequences in Docker notation correlate to positive twists and descending to negative. Interesting. And there's some details to work out there in the sort of the head turning that you were seeing. there's a chance we could put that onto a, a firmer foundation as well. Um, and it seems like in these simple examples where the Conway notation has a short length, Conway notation had length two for this one, length one for that example, uh, it seems like that would be easier to spot. Whereas already, maybe in a knot like 6-3, where the Conway notation is really long, it's got four, in fact five if you want to split this two here at the end, um, then it's going to be a little bit harder to spot which of these are positive, which of these are negative twists, like this two down here on the bottom. Um, that looks like it could be, well, how would we consider that positive or negative? This is probably positive two down here on the bottom. Um, but then the ones, the ones are always going to be the hard ones uh, to sort of tease out because they happen really quickly. They can be vertical. They can be horizontal. Um, but yeah, that'd be interesting to look into a little further too. Um, so these are two filamentary connections between Docker and Conway uh, that I think are worth, are worth us thinking about some more. <laughs>